All right, uh, go ahead and get started here. Uh, continuing with section 5.6. Uh, so uh, this is the last problem we left off at. The ones we did before, we had uh, one, uh, basically just one exponent, but this time we have one that has two exponents in there. So two x's we have to, uh, two different places, one on each side. So these kind of problems, unfortunately, you cannot do them with the equal basis property because two and five, we can't write those as the same base. Uh, and so instead, what we're going to do is we want to release the exponents, uh, get rid of them. So the way to do that is by applying a log to both sides. So we're actually going to do the same process we did for this example we did last time. So here we put an LN on both sides and allow us to free up the exponent and bring it down in front. We're gonna do the same thing on this one. Now, again, you could either use LN or you could use a log in this case, because since we don't have an E here, just a two and a five, uh, it's probably better just to use an LN. So what I'll do is I'm gonna put a natural log on both sides. So natural log of two to the X plus one, and I'm gonna put an LN on this side as well. Okay, so I've got ln on both sides. The purpose for doing this is so that you can take the, uh, the exponent and you can move the exponent down in front. So we're going to put the exponent down in front for each of those. So I have x plus one times ln two. And then over here, I'm going to put one minus two x, bring that down in front. And then I have ln five. So moving that down in front, I've got uh, both of those uh, have now been eliminated from the exponent position because of the properties of logs that's using uh, property number five when we talk about the log properties, that's what allows us to do that. Now that they're moved down in front, they're just turned into multiplication. So we're going to multiply both of these. Now when you multiply the X times LN2, it does not turn into ln 2x. Okay, you're not allowed to change anything inside. It's kind of like if you have a, an x and you're multiplying it by a square root of something, you can't put the x inside the square root. That's the same idea here. So when we multiply that, we have to just write it as x ln 2. It's not ln 2x. That's all you can do. The x does not go inside. And then we have times the 1, so we have plus ln 2. Okay, so next thing we're going to do is take do the same thing here. We're going to multiply ln5 times both of those. So ln5 times 1 is just ln5. And I have minus, again, this 2x here. I can't multiply that by the 5. So we're just going to leave it on the outside like this. Okay, so now we've expanded everything out. Now the idea here is because we have two different x's, the way that we're going to solve that is we want to get all the terms that had x and put them on one side. Everything else we're going to put on the other side of the equation. So for this, I'm going to add the 2x over to the other side. So I have plus 2x ln 5. I still have the ln 2. And I have this. And now in this next step, I'm going to subtract ln 2 from both sides. And that's going to leave us with everything that has X's on one side. So we're going to, uh, we subtracted the LN2, it became negative when we brought it across the equal sign. The whole reason for getting both the X's on one side is because then you can factor out an X. Okay, so we're gonna factor out X from here and that's gonna leave us with LN2 plus two LN5. Okay, so it's, an X is a common factor, so that's why we're able to factor it out. Uh, and then from there, we just need to divide both sides by what's inside the parentheses. LN5 minus LN2, all that over LN2 plus 2 LN5. So that you see down at the bottom, this is going to be the, the final answer that you have. Uh, so it's just this whole thing divided by this. Now, uh, on a test, you don't have to worry about getting a decimal approximation or something like this. 
Now, if you are going to put it into a calculator, if the homework asks you to get the decimal equivalent for this, for instance, then what you would have to do on a calculator is you'd have to put it together with, uh, enter, or enter it in, I should say, with the, let's write the right thing first. Uh, you want to use parentheses around this. So we're going to do ln5 minus ln2 parentheses, then divide, and then all of this needs to also be around with parentheses. So if you are going to enter into the calculator, you do need parentheses around the entire top and around the bottom. If you don't put these parentheses in there, the calculator is going to divide the wrong thing. You want to make sure that everything on top is divided by everything on the bottom. So for calculator purposes, you want to put the parentheses around all that when you're entering that in. The other problems that we're left with in this section are ones that we have multiple exponents like that, and then a number that does not have an exponent in it. So these are, these are very specific problems, have a very specific way of solving them. What it is, is these problems are, what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn them into something that's more familiar that we know how to solve. With three terms like this, we're actually gonna turn this into a quadratic equation. Okay, it's quadratic because we have a, a two, a one, and no power here. So it's kind of similar to a quadratic. Now, uh, some of you might be able to know how to factor this directly, but most probably do not. So we're gonna do a, a method here where we're going to change it into a quadratic and then we can factor it in its new form. The way that we're gonna accomplish this is by making substitutions. Uh, this, this one right here, we're going to go ahead and call that u. So we're going to let u equal 3 to the x. I'm going to ignore the minus sign in front, just the exponent part. So I'm going to let u equal 3 to the x. Now what happens is if I square both sides, I have 3x squared, which that's going to equal 3 to the x squared. So I've got u is equal to 3 to the x, and u squared equals 3 to the x squared. Now, it's always going to work out this way for these specific problems that you'll be able to get a u and a u squared. So what's going to happen is the 3 to the 2x, we're going to, or not x squared, I wrote the wrong thing here. I meant to put 2x because you're multiplying these. Power raised to their power, you multiply the exponents. So 3 to the 2x is your u squared, and 3 to the x is your u. So therefore, we can change the problem into this one right here. I, I took out the three of the X, replaced it with a U, took out the three of the two X and turned it into the U squared. Uh, and so now we've changed it from a, a, a some kind of exponential equation to now a quadratic. With quadratics, now we have the ability to factor. So we're gonna factor this now with the U's. Factors of negative 72 that add up to negative one, you're gonna have to use eight and nine. So then we'll have u and u here. And in order to get a negative, the nine needs to be negative and the eight is positive. That way, when you add them together, you'll get negative u. So now it is, it's uh, factored. Because it is factored, we can now set both of these equal to zero. And we'll get u equals negative eight and u equals nine. Now, that's not the answer to the whole problem because the original problem had an X in it and we solve for U. So in order to be able to get the answer, we need to put our substitutions back in for each of these again. So I'm not going to use the 3 to the 2X because that, that's only for U squared. I don't have U squared here. I only have a U. So I need to just put in the 3 to the X. So 3 to the X equals negative 8. 3 to the X equals 9. Now this one over here, the second equation, we can solve that right away because three to what power equals nine? We know that's gonna equal two because we could change the nine into three squared and then use equal basis property or just know that three to the second power is nine. So I already know one of my answers is X equals two. Now the other side, I don't have the same base. So what I would do if they don't have the same base is I have to take the natural log of both sides natural log of three of the X equals natural log of negative eight. The problem with this is that we can't take the log of a negative number, it's undefined. 
So because we get LN negative eight, that means that we're not gonna get a solution from that particular equation. So there's no number three, three of the X that is gonna give you uh, negative eight. So there's no solution there, which means that we only have one answer on this problem. And the answer is going to just be X equals two. So that's it. Okay, so that's the answer for this. So we're, all these problems that kind of sort of look like quadratic because we have three terms like that. That's ones that you can solve by using this U substitution we've been talking about here. So let's do another one of those where we have to do another uh, substitution. Okay, so let's do the next one. Okay, so this one here, again, the this part, uh, so the circle part, this is gonna become our U, the U, and then this part here, is going to become our u squared. So automatically, u equals to the x, u squared equals to the 2x. Again, these problems are purposely set up that way to where they're always going to work out. Notice that I'm not using the 7 at all here. And the reason why I'm not is because these substitutions you make are only for the exponential pieces that you see here. So the 7 I mean, let's leave it alone. We're just substituting in the 2 of the x and 2 of the 2x. In doing so, it'll leave you with u squared. Now, of course, the negative 7 still needs to remain there in the original problem. So it's just going to be a minus 7u and then plus 12 equals 0. So now I have the next quadratic that we can now factor. Factors of 12 that add up to negative 7 will be three and four. And this time, both of these need to be negative to, to in order to get negative seven in there. We're going to set both of those equal to zero. So I get u equals three, u equals four. Again, that's not the final answer because we got to solve for x, not for u. So we have to put our substitution back in again. So instead of the u, we're going to put in 2 of the x. So 2 of the x equals 3. And I have 2 of the x equals 4. This one over here, 2 of the x equals 4, that we can just solve that right away. 2 raised to what power equals 4? That's going to have to be 2 again. So x equals 2 on this problem, because we can write 4 as 2 squared. Now, the other one does not have the same base. So we do need to take the natural log of both sides. Okay, so natural log of both sides, we're gonna do natural log of two of the X equals natural log of three. That allows you now, since we don't have any negatives to deal with, this one will give us an answer. So the X comes down in front, X ln two equals ln three. And then if we divide that, let's take that over to here. X is going to equal ln3 over ln2. We just divide both those out. And then, of course, you can put that in the calculator and get a decimal equivalent, but uh, you can just leave it in terms of natural logs, and that's fine. So the, what made this problem different, the reason why we were able to do this is because there was no negative this time. So I had ln of 3, which we can do. So the, last, the previous problem, we had a negative in there. So that's why you couldn't take the natural log of a negative number. Uh, but this time, you could. So we do have two answers. We have x equals 2. And then the other answer is ln3 over ln2. So we do get two answers on this one, just that one of them happens to be a decimal. One last problem we'll do is this one that has the, the e's that are in it the u is going to be equal to e to the x, and then u squared is our e to the 2x that we have uh, right there. It's our substitution next. Uh, will the 3 and the 2 be in parentheses? The question asked in the, yeah, when you when you enter these into uh, my open math, uh, they usually tend to put it, when you put ln in there, it automatically comes up with a parenthesis. So when you put those into, into there, they're gonna look like this. And also the answer that you put, if you click on the answer for these, it is gonna have the parentheses uh, inside. Uh, and so when you type them in like that, 
then uh, you do need to put the parentheses in when you have that. But uh, when you do your scratch work, uh, for, for like the test, for instance, you don't have to show the, you don't have to put the parentheses on it. You can just leave it LN3 over LN2. But yeah, that is something when you enter them into my open math, you do need the, uh, the parentheses on that one, typically what, how they ask that. So, um, okay. So next we'll go on to this here. Uh, we're, we make our substitutions, we get u squared minus 6u minus 16 equals zero. And then we're gonna factor it. Factors of 16 that add up to negative six, uh, we're gonna use four and four doesn't work. So we're gonna use two and eight. And then the eight needs to be negative. So we're gonna do u plus two and u minus eight and multiply to make negative 16, two times negative eight, but add it together to be negative six. Set both of them equal to zero. So we get u equals negative two, u equals eight. Uh, this one, we're gonna put e to the x in because that's our u that we have. So e to the x equals negative two, e to the x equals eight. This first one we can already tell is not going to have a solution because if you take the natural log of both sides, again, we have another situation where you're taking the natural log of negative number, that's no good. So that's going to be no solution for that part. Now, the other one, we can do natural log, both sides. So natural log of E is going to cancel out. So you just get natural log of eight. And that's your only answer on this one. So that's your single answer, LN8. Uh, that's what we get. Okay. okay, so this is the last problem that was in section 5.6. And so now we're going to go on to next section 5.7. 5.7 is actually a pretty short uh, session. It just has, has to do with some financial models that are in there so it's kind of an application of the exponential functions so we'll go on to that one uh, next year okay so 5.7 financial models uh, so the main thing that we're going to talk about in this section is uh, compound interest uh, and also simple interest we're going to talk about in here as well so what uh, what this is, is we have a, an exponent that we're using on this, and this is allow us to find if we're getting compound interest in a savings account or something like that, we can figure out how much uh, we're going to have in our account after a certain period of time. So here is the formula, A equals P times, and inside parentheses, we have one plus R over N. And then up here in the exponent, that's an N and N times a T. We have so n actually appears twice in the formula. So, uh, so basically, what's happening, where this formula comes from, is sim regular simple interest is i equals prt, and so as it says here, the, the interest is calculated once, and then the interest is added to what you originally started with, and then the formula is repeated again. So then you're finding the interest upon interest essentially is what's happening there. And so that's what's called compound interest and where, the, where it actually comes from. So uh, the way this works here is the, the P is the, the amount that you're investing or maybe the amount that you have stored in an account. And the A is, the, is how much money is gonna be in the account after a certain number of years. And T represents years. So in this formula, it only works if your time is in terms of years. So again, compound interest formula only works when time is in terms of years. Now we have one more variable that's in there and this variable is N. And I put a list down here of what the different, the N's represent. So when you're reading these problems, uh, these word problems, you're going to see keywords that appear in here. And depending on what the keyword is, that's how you know what the value for N is. So I have these all listed here. And you can see annually, N is one. It's compounded once per year. Semi-annually would be two times a year. Quarterly, four times. 
monthly is 12, weekly is 52. And then daily, we're not using a banker's rule here. If it's daily, we do need to use 365 instead of 360. So we are gonna use the 365 for all the problems uh, that you'll see there. So basically you're just going to plug information into a formula and then get the answer. So these are all calculator based questions. So let's, let's try one of these and set it up. Uh, so first of all, before I do anything, I need to uh, identify what kind of information is given based on our variables. It says 300 hours is invested at 12% compounded monthly for one and a half years. Find the amount that results from this investment. So if we run through what's provided, P is 300. Now the interest rate, the, the rate that you see here, the 12%, when you put that into the formula, it must be a decimal. So you have to change the percent into a decimal. That's very important. It's a common place to make a mistake is forgetting to do that. So we're, when we put it in the formula, it's going to be 0.12. So whenever you want to change your percent into a decimal, you just move the decimal place two places to the left. Uh, and then the time is 1.5 years. So we put 1.5 in there as well. And it says find the amount that results from the investment. So we want to find A in this case. Now here's the formula. P1 plus R over N, the NT. And so now we're just going to put in, oh yeah, one more thing too. We have the word compounded monthly. And so that means that your N is equal to 12. So that's one more piece of information we got. So Compounded monthly, monthly we look at our chart here. So monthly means it's N is equal to 12 that we put in the formula. So now at this point, it's just going to be plugging the numbers into the formula and getting the answer. So you have one plus 0.12 over N, N is 12. That's raised to the, there's an N times T up here. So it's going to be 12 times 1.5. To do this, you do want to make sure that you follow the order of operations, which means that you want to do the, the part of parentheses, and we're also going to multiply the exponents. So we're going to do those at the same time. So we're going to do 300. And then this inside here, uh, if you put this into the calculator, 1 plus 0.12 over 12, that's going to be 1 plus 0.01. So 1.01 you get there. And that's being raised to the power of 18. And so that's 12 times 1.5 is 18. So you want to do that step first to simplify everything. And now we're ready to put this into a calculator. If you have a graphing calculator, you can actually just type this in as is. You can just do 300 times 1.01, get the caret key, and then 18. Otherwise, uh, you'll have to use the caret key on your calculator. So again, if you don't have a caret key, like a graphing calculator, you might have a, a y of the x key, or maybe you might it's x to the y. Just depends on what kind of what calculator that you actually have. Uh, so it's going to be one of those buttons that you'll put on there. So you'll do 300 times, hit one of these buttons, uh, yeah, 300 times 1.01, and then times, hit one of these buttons, and then 18. If you have a TI-30XA calculator, it requires you to put them in a different order. So you'd have to put in, uh, it usually requires you to put, use the exponent part you can put in first. So 1.01, hit one of these buttons, then 18, and then times 300. So either way, you want to do that. Now, if you put that into the calculator correctly, you're end, you end up getting 358.84. Okay, so that's the one that you have. If you're not sure how to use exponents on your particular calculator, of course, you can always just uh, uh, just search for it online, just open up a, a web browser and then put that in there and maybe put, put your calculator name and then put manual and then search for it. And you'll probably find the manual for your calculator. So that's gonna tell you how to enter that in. So that's what I would suggest if you're not sure how to use the exponent. Now it is of course something you wanna make sure you understand by the time we take the test, um, so next week when we take the test and final, you definitely want to make sure you, want, you know how to use the exponent key on your calculator. So you might want to play around with that and make sure you know how to, how to use it. All right, so next thing, uh, we've got this 
This problem is a little bit different than the one we had before. It says if a person borrows $5,100 and then after three months pays off the loan in the amount of this, what is the, a, so okay, this time we're, we're finding something different. Okay, so this is, it doesn't say anything about compound interest here. Okay, uh, so this is gonna be done a little bit differently. Now, the way we're gonna do this is first, we're gonna identify uh, the information that's provided. So again, P is provided 5,100 is what that is. Okay, and then we've got uh, the next thing that we have here is the 52,750, that's actually the A value. So A is 5,277, um, wrote that wrong, 5,227.5, 50 right there. So that is the, that's the A value that you have. Now the R is what we're trying to find on this. So the reason why this is done a little bit differently is that we're not using compound interest because notice that this problem does not say compounded monthly, compounded weekly, something like that. So there's no N that we're gonna be using in this. In fact, we're not gonna be using the compound interest formula at all. We're actually gonna use the simple interest formula on this, I equals PRT. So this is the formula. This right here is called simple interest. Okay, that's I equals PRT. Now, the way that this works is that we're borrowing 5,100 and after three months, we pay off the loan amount of this. So after the interest has been added, it's this amount, 5,227.50. So here's the way this is gonna work. Your, the amount that you're paying is the principal and then you're also paying interest as well. So this amount, 5,227.5, that includes both the original principal you have and the interest that's obtained by it. So essentially it's principal plus interest. So I so for this, what we wanna use is instead of the interest, the I there, we're gonna put the PRT in there for it instead. So I have my amount and I'm adding the interest to it just like that. I can either leave it like this or if I wanna factor out a P, I could do that as well and just have P times one plus RT, I can do that. So this is actually the formula that we wanna use in this case. So it's a little bit different than before because again, nothing is mentioned for compounded. You have to see the word compounded in there in order to use the compound interest formula. Since it's not in here, if it's not provided, then we have to, most likely you're using simple interest instead. So I'm gonna put 5227.5, 50 right there. I have 5,100, I have one plus RT. So the R, don't know what that is uh, there. Now, one thing we do know here that we didn't put in the formula, that we didn't put in our list, I, I missed that part. This part right here, three months. So for that, we actually wanna change it into years because remember that these formulas with uh, simple interest and compound interest, they only work if T is in terms of years. So if I have three months, I just take three divided by 12 months, that's gonna give me 0.25. So 0.25 years is what we're gonna put. So 0.25 is now what I wanna put in over here as well. So I'm putting that into this side of the formula. Now I'm gonna multiply this out and I'll continue this up here. So if I multiply this out 5,100 times both of those, I get 5227.5, 50 equals 5,100. And then if I multiply, I have 5,100 times 0.25, and there's also times an R uh, as well. So that's gonna give you 1275R. 5,100 times 0.25 times R will give you 1275R. So we just did that so we can get R by itself. So now we can subtract 5,100 from there. So 12750 is gonna equal 1275R. Then we're just gonna divide both sides um, by 1275. 
12.75 and 12.75 here. And by doing all that, we're going to get 0.1 equals R when we divide by that. So that means that we want to put 10% because remember the, this is a decimal when you get, but it's asking you for the rate an interest rate, which means it's a percent. So we just multiply by a hundred or move the decimal place two places over to the right. And then we get 10%. So 10% is the answer on this particular problem. So again, a little bit differently, a little bit different problem here because we don't have a, a compound compounded part that's in there. So if you don't see the word compounded, that means you're not using the compound interest formula means you're got to, you got to use the simple interest formula instead. That's how you know the difference, which one to use. All right, so we're gonna go back to compounding. So we're, we have continuous, something that's called continuous compounding. So uh, this has a different formula and that's this one, A equals PE the RT. So that, that right there uh, is, the, is the formula itself for compounded continuously. So you're actually gonna see the word as this example right here. You need to actually see the word compounded continuously in there. And that tells you that you're using a different formula. Essentially what you're having here is, uh, instead of having N compounded daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, like that, it's being compounded uh, an infinite number of times. So if you have N being compounded continuously, then all that stuff that you have, one plus R over N to the NT, it turns out that it all ends up equaling uh, E to the RT. Now, the way to show that would be using uh, a calculus, particularly actually calculus two. Uh, and so that, that's something that you, that you would not see unless you go into calculus two, how that works. So, uh, so basically for now, we're just, we're just saying, okay, if N goes to infinity, then we have an E that comes out after it. So, but that can be shown uh, through calculus that we're not going to show here. All right, so we're going to identify the information that is provided. 300 is your principal. Your R, we have to change that to a decimal again. It's compounded continuously. There is no N on this. Uh, and your T is, again, 1.5 years we have for that. So we're going to put all this into the this new formula. We have E equals PE to the R. T, that's the formula we're using. The E is the E that's on your calculator. That's the E caret key that's above your natural log button on your calculator. That's the one you're using here to get the answer. We're finding the, uh, the amount that results. So A equals, so, okay, so principal we have 300. We have E to the 0.12 and we're multiplying this by 1.5. So the first thing to do would be to multiply the exponents together. So 0.12 times 1.5, and you're gonna get 0 0.18 there, 0.18. So on this, you wanna use, again, on, the, on your calculator, you have a natural log button, but you wanna use the either E the X, E the Y, E the caret, depending on what your calculator has. You'll have to hit the shift button or a second button in order to get that on top, that's the one you wanna use this time. So you don't wanna use the E, the X or a carrot key. You wanna make sure there's an E involved in there because it'll give you a different answer. So if you put that into the calculator correctly, you're gonna get $359.17. Okay, so that's what, you, that's what you should get. If you're not getting that, then you wanna go back and double check uh, your answer, but uh, to try and make, uh, try, make sure you understand how to do that in your calculator, but you, that's what you should get. I do want to compare this to the one we did previously. The other one we did compounded continuously for daily. We actually had all the same information. The principal was the same. The rate was the same. The time was the same. We just used a different formula. So up here, we use compounded monthly. So monthly for 1.5 years, and we got $358.84. Notice that if we compound it continuously, we do get slightly more because again, it's compounding it more times than what we had before for monthly. It's not a huge difference, but of course, if your principal is big enough, then that you will see a, a noticeable difference there as far as that. Uh, another type of problem that is 
in the homework is one like this, where it says determine the rate that represents the better deal. 9% compounded quarterly or nine and a quarter percent compounded annually. So on the one hand, we have 1% that percent that's higher, but it's compounded less times per year. Or we have a lower interest rate, but it's compounded more times a year. So we want to basically see which one of those gives us uh, more money. Well, notice that this time we're not given a principal or a time. So on this problem, we're just going to make that up for this one. We're going to go ahead and use a thousand for principal, and then I'll just use one year for the time. I only have to use one year because if I already make more interest in one year, then of course, however many more years you have after, it'll always continue to make a higher interest, whatever one ends up being the answer here. And you don't have to use a thousand for principal. If you wanted to use one dollar, uh, you could certainly do that as well. But I just picked 1,000 arbitrarily. So again, it doesn't matter what you actually pick to use. So on the, we actually have two separate problems we're going to do here. Over here, so we already know principal and time, but on this one, the rate equals 0.09. So again, take the decimal and move it two places to the left. So rate is 0.09 and the N is going to be four. But over here, okay, so this is nine and a quarter percent, that's 9.25. So this is really 9.25. You change that into a decimal, you move it two places, over, you get 0 0.0925. Now here is the most common mistake I see students making on both the homework and the test. For some reason, I always see people getting rid of the, the 25 on the end. It's like, oh, 25, that's extra decimals to type in. They're not important, I'll just, I'll just erase those. Okay, unfortunately that's incorrect because your calculator, especially if you're raising something to a power, you need to make sure you have the exact decimal that's in here for the rate because 0 .09, something raised to the 0 0.029 or 0 0.0925 versus something being raised to 0 0.09, that's gonna be two totally different answers, especially if the base is a large number like that, that's gonna make a big difference. So instead, you wanna make sure that you leave all the decimals, do not ever round the decimal that is on the interest rate. Never round that. Leave all the decimals in place when you do these calculations. That's the most important thing about this problem. So now for both of these, we're gonna use A equals P one plus R over N to the NT. We're gonna use this on both, both sides. So here we have the principal we said was a thousand. One plus 0.09. So let's, let me put the zero in front here, 0. 0 0.09 over n, which is four. Oh, by the way, this other one over here, my n is equal to one on this other side because we have the word component annually. So on this side, it's n equals one. But this side is n equals four because we got the word quarterly that's there. This is raised to the four times, again, the, the time is one year. So we'll just do four times one. We're gonna simplify everything inside the parentheses. Now when you do that, you get 1.0225 to the fourth power. Here's another thing point I want to mention. Do not ever round the number inside the parentheses. If you round the number inside the parentheses, for instance, if you put 1.02 in there, that's going to throw your answer off enough to where it'll be marked wrong on both the test and my open math. Do not round the number inside. You wanna leave all the decimals in place when you do that. Now, of course, if it's a continuing decimal and it continues forever like that, then yeah, you can round it, but you probably wanna use at least four decimal places, something like that. So if it was 1.02555555 continuing forever, for instance, uh, then I would just go ahead and round it maybe after four places and that would be enough accuracy. But the, most of these problems you're gonna do, they're gonna have a terminating decimal inside the parentheses. So leave all the decimals in place. Don't round this number inside, leave all the decimals in place. So when you do and put this into the calculator, you're gonna get 1,093 and eight cents. Okay, so that's what we get for that one. Let's do the same thing for the other side. We have 1,000, we have one plus 
Now this time we're going to use again all the decimals 1.0925. All that's going to be over one because that's your n. Up here it's one times one. Inside the parentheses you're going to get 1.0925. That's raised to the first power, or we don't even need to show that anymore. So we just all we need to do we don't have to even use the exponent key in this case because you're just going to multiply those both together. Okay, so basically all this will do is move the decimal place over to get 1,092 and 50 cents. Okay, so we have that. Now it's not a whole lot different, but it, as it turns out, the lower interest rate is actually the one that is, uh, gives you more interest. So in this case, I would put 9% compounded quarterly. Uh, that results in the better deal. What they mean by better deal is whatever one gives you the most interest. Okay, so you'll get the most interest here. It's not a whole lot, it's not a huge amount, only about a, less than a dollar difference there, but it's still, will give you a little bit more interest. And so if you had to, if it had to choose, in this case, 9% compounded quarterly would be better. Now, another thing that's in here is something that is called the effective rate of interest. And so this kind of describes what that is here. So it says, suppose you have a certain amount to invest in it and a bank offers to pay you a certain percentage annual interest rate compounded monthly. So it, it's basically saying, uh, what simple interest is needed to earn the same amount? So basically, if I want to compare this uh, to, so I have, if I have uh, a compound interest, I'm basically comparing it to a simple interest. So if I'm looking at this for, for what one year, for instance, what rate with simple interest is going to equal the same rate with compound, compound interest? That's what it's talking about. There's a formula that you just have to plug in in order to get that here. So the effective rate of interest. Uh, for earning an annual interest rate R compounded n times per year is given by this formula. So really all you have to do is just plug that, plug it in uh, to get the answer. So notice there's only, there's no principle here at all. It doesn't matter what the principle is. It's just talking about the effective rate of interest itself. All you need on that is you just need to know the, the R and the N. That's all you have to know. So like this one here, it says find the effective rate of interest for 24% compounded quarterly. Okay, well, this is going to tell us that R is equal to uh, 0.24 and the N is equal to 4. That's what we get for this problem. So all we have to do is put it in the here. So we have R with a, an E underneath it. That just means you're talking about effective rate of interest. That's the notation that's used for that. We have one plus R is 0 0.24, 0 0.24 divided by four raised to the power of four. And then don't forget this minus one on the end. That's part of the formula as well. So what we need to do is just put that into a calculator uh, to get the answer. So let's do that. We're gonna get it here. Um, so let's put this capital letter E down there. Uh, so probably you want to do the uh, the inside part. You probably want to uh, figure that part out first. So if you put that inside, one plus 0.24 divided by four, uh, all that inside is going to give you 1.06. So 1.06 to so the fourth power minus one. And now you just put that into a calculator. You can put any of that all in at once. And so if you put that all in to your calculator, it's gonna give you 0.26248, okay? So if you wanna change that into a percent, you just move the decimal place two places over to the right. So the effective rate of interest is going to be 26. Point, uh, it depends on what they tell you to round to. I'll just leave all the decimals in there, but It'll, it'll say in my open math uh, what you want to round that to, but 26.248, if, if you don't round anything, then it's just left to that. But you can look and see what it's asking to round to, whether it's two decimal places or one decimal place. Uh, you can round appropriately, depending on what they tell you to round to there.
Okay, so next thing, it says what, uh, what rate of interest compounded annually is required to double an investment in nine years? Okay, so this time uh, we're not given uh, an investment. So we can make one up. We could use a hundred or a thousand. It doesn't really matter what you wanna pick for, for P. Let's just go ahead and, and we'll do P equals a hundred. That way we have something to use in the formula. Compounding annually means N is one. The interest rate, uh, we don't know what that is. Okay, so this is unknown. And then the time is nine years. Okay, so we have that. Let's put this into our formula. So we have P one plus R over N to the NT. Now again, I arbitrarily chose hundred dollars for, for P. It could have been a thousand, I could use one dollar, doesn't matter. Okay, so I'm just gonna use a hundred in this case. Now I'll put this in here, I have 100. One plus R is what I'm trying to find. It's uh, N is one because we got the word annually here. This is one times nine. Now for doubling an investment, that means that if I double it, it's gonna be 200 over here. So if I start with 100, then it doubles, it'll be 200. So I can simplify this. I can do 200 equals 100, one plus R to the ninth, ninth power. Okay, so that's what that's going to simplify to. I wanna solve for R. To do that, I need to isolate the term that has the R in it. So I'm gonna first begin by dividing both sides by 100. And I'll get a two here. So two equals one plus one plus R to the ninth power. I need to get rid of the ninth power that's here. Now, the only way to do that is to take the ninth root of both sides. So I'm gonna do the ninth root of two, and then the ninth root of one plus R to the ninth. I'm doing the ninth root because doing so will allow you to cancel out the, the roots all together. So I get the ninth root of two is equal to one plus R. Then from here, I'm gonna subtract the R, or subtract the um, one from both sides. So I get the ninth root of two minus one, and that's gonna give you the R. So we'll have to put this into a calculator. So if you put that into a calculator, you're gonna get a 0 0.0801, but then we have to change that to a percent. So you just put the decimal place two places to the, the right. And so 8.01% is your your rate so it depends on what they want you to round to it might be a whole number then you'll just put eight um, or hundreds or thousands so it depends on what they're telling you to round to and but in this case we'll just leave it since it doesn't tell us what to round to we'll just leave our answer is 8.01 percent so that's the that's the percentage rate i would need in order to double my investment now so it actually doesn't matter uh what what you put for p because as you notice here, because we're dividing, if you have something that's doubled, you're always gonna end up with a two here. If it was tripled, you'd have a three here and so forth. So it actually doesn't matter what you put there for that. In fact, in the, uh, in the notes, the written notes, I actually just didn't even put anything in there for principal at all. I just start out with P and then double that will just be two times P. But sometimes it makes sense, if you more sense if you have an actual number to plug in. So that's why I put that in there for you, so we have, uh, have an actual number to, to work with. All right, so we have we have one more problem that we'll do in this session, and then we'll we'll go ahead and, and go on to 5.8 just to introduce it. Okay, we have one more section here, or one more problem. Here. What will a 90,000 house cost 10 years from now if the price appreciation for homes over the period averages 4% Compounded annually. So, yeah, obviously, this is a you can tell this is a dated problem because a $90,000 house in Las Vegas, if you can tell me where one is, let me know. I'd like to buy it. So, that probably doesn't exist. But anyway, we'll go ahead and with this one, we're going to uh, identify what information is given. Again, we've got a 
principal is 90,000. That's how much. So we actually are still going to use A equals, oops, the pen glitched out there for a second. A equals P1 plus R over N to the NT. Okay, so this right here uh, is the formula we're going to use. The principal is the amount. So basically, what we're trying to do is we're trying to see what a house will eventually appraise to if you're starting with 90,000 and we're averaging 4% compounded annually. It's basically just another problem where we're plugging numbers into the compound interest formula. Okay, now we don't have the word compounded continuously here, so we're going back to the N. It does say compounded annually, which means that N is equal to one. 4% is the rate, so it's 0.04 that we're gonna have for that. And your time, it says 10 years from now, so your time is gonna be uh, 10. So that's all the information that has been provided with this. So now it's just a matter of plugging all that in. So 90,000, they have here, 90,000. One plus the rate is going to be 0.04 divided by the N is one, one times 10. Okay, so we have that. You always want to simplify the part inside the parentheses. So 1.04 we get raised to the 10th power. And now it's just a matter of putting that into the calculator. So if we put, put typed it in, punch that in there. Again, you wanna use the exponent key. We're not, you're gonna use that button above the LN. That's E, e caret key. You wanna use just the E the X or E the Y or, or I'm sorry, um, X to the, X to the Y or Y to the X key you want to use here or a carrot key. Okay, so you're not using E at all on this. You're just using these, going back to these same buttons again, something like that. So if you put that in correctly, I'll just give you the, the final answer. Final result here is 133,221.99. And that's what it would, that's what you would get when you put that into the calculator. So, uh, over the course of 10 years, it'll be, it'll rise up to this value. So again, uh, that's what, that's it's just another example of a compound interest formula. It's just an application of what that would be. So I tried to go through uh, one problem of each type that's going to be in the homework for 5.7. And so that's going to be pretty much each problem that you're going to see in there is, is going to, to be that. Um, and so that's, that's what we get. All right, so now uh, we're going to go on to uh, section 5.8. Remember, this week we only have uh, basically two more days of lecture after this, which is why I'm going on to 5.8, because we only have a couple days left. So we have basically tomorrow and Wednesday, uh, and that's going to be the uh, Wednesday is actually going to be the last day of new material for this course, because then Thursday this week we're going to do a review for test number three. Next week, we have just uh, a test a review and then a final for next week. What you will notice is that I have opened up the, the final exam bonus review assignment. Has op it opened up today. Uh, and so you have from now until the last day of class uh, to complete that. So what that is, is just explain that again. It's an extra credit assignment uh, where it's, it's very similar to the, the actual problems that will be on the final exam. If you do that and complete it, uh, whatever percentage that you get on that, it'll be multiplied by three points and then that'll be added to your final exam score. If you, if you get the full three points, that means that's a five percentage points added to your final exam. So if you do that, uh, you have from now until the last day of class to, uh, to complete that. That's gonna be in my open math. It is in next week's folder. Uh, so if you go in next week's folder, you'll find it there and you'll see it's already open. So. That's just something to remind you about here. All right, so we're gonna go to, so basically we have three sections total that we're gonna do 5.8. And then the last two sections have to do with existence of equations and things like that. So we'll get to that uh, tomorrow, but we'll go ahead and start, start this now and we'll continue this tomorrow as well. So uh, we have a exponential growth in the K is all we're gonna talk about today. Newton's law of cooling, we won't get to until tomorrow next time. I just want to introduce this uh, first. 
So uh, exponential growth in the K, and here's what the formula is that we're using. We had A of T. So all that this means is this is function notation. We have a formula, we're calling it A, and it has T as the main variable inside. So it's A sub zero. So the A of T is the current population. A sub zero is the original population. And we have a K that represents a kind of a growth. It could be either a growth or decay. So this formula is, is an account for both uh, growth and decay. Now, what makes it a, a growth problem is if, so I'll put this up here. So if K is, uh, K is greater than zero, excuse me, K is greater than zero, I can write, uh, that means we have a growth. And if K is less than zero, then we have a decay. Growth means that uh, it's like a bacteria growth where we're always, you know, bacteria is growing and growing and growing, something like that. A decay, uh, examples of that that we'll get to eventually is talking about radioactive decay. So uh, as substance uh, decays over time. So we're gonna talk about half-life. That's gonna be in this section that we'll get to a little bit later. If you look at this formula, it may look a little bit similar to a formula we already looked at. In fact, it is something similar we looked at in the previous section with financial models. We had the uh, A equals P, P e to the RT, the compound, compounded continuously formula. It's actually the same formula, but we just have different variables because it's in different contexts here, but it really is the same thing. We have a number times E raised to some two things multiplied together. And so that's the formula we're using here. So let's jump into one of these problems. And so the first thing we want to do is some problems that will ask us to actually come up with the exponential growth formula based on the information that's provided. So it says at the start of the experiment, there are 125 cells. Three hours later, there are 235 cells. What we want to do is identify what information is provided, and then we're going to plug it into this growth formula and find out what the general formula is. Okay, so I'll again identify what's provided. At the start of the experiment, there's 125 cells. So this is our A sub zero. This is 125, that's what's given. That's the start, original population. Now it says after three hours, so time is three hours here. The A of T now is going to be 235 cells. Okay, so that information is provided. We don't know what the K value is. This is actually what we're gonna try and solve for with the information provided. The formula that we use is A, A of T equals A sub zero E to the KT. We're just gonna plug in this information. A of T is 235, A sub zero is 125. Okay, K, we don't know what it is, but then the, the T is three years. So we're just gonna plug that in just like that. Next thing we wanna do is we wanna solve for the K. Now, in order to do that, we have to isolate the term that has K in it. So right here, we've got the 125, we wanna get that to, to go away. So we're gonna take 235, divided by 125. Okay, so 235 divided by 125 is gonna give you a 1.88. So that's not a repeating decimal, that's a terminal decimal there. So 1.88 equals E to the, and we can just simplify that to 3K. Now in order to solve this, we have to actually go back and use our techniques we talked about in at the beginning of class today uh, in the 5.6 section, whenever we want to solve something like this, we want to take the natural log of both sides. So I'm going to do natural log of 1.88, natural log of e to the 3k. Remember that we talked about in the properties of logarithms section, we mentioned that there's a property there where if you have ln and e together, the answer is just going to be what's in the exponent position. So we get ln of 1.88 is going to equal 3k. 
then we can just divide both sides by three. Your K is equal to natural log of 1.88 divided by three. Now, one thing that you wanna pay attention to is what decimal place that it's gonna ask you to round to. So in the homework, there is specific, uh, it'll tell you specifically what you wanna round to on these problems. Now on the, uh, the test, and what I'm gonna do here in my notes, I'm just gonna round everything to four decimal places. And I'm gonna double check this for you just to make sure that that's what it says in the homework. Cause I always wanna be consistent with the problems I'm doing here. I wanna be consistent with the way it asked you for in the homework. Um, and so for something like this, uh, let's see, it says, yeah. So it does say in the homework um, below where you type the equation in, it does say round K to four decimal places. So that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna round this to four decimal places. Okay, so ln 1.88, uh, if we do that, that's gonna give you, I should say that instead of equal sign, I gotta use the, uh, um, use the approximate symbol, that's better. Okay, so this is gonna be 0.2104. Okay, so 0.2104 is the answer you'll get for that. Now, this is not what you're gonna put for the answer. Okay, it's asking you for a exponential growth formula. Just putting K equals 0.2104, that's not the formula that they're looking for. We have to use the, the growth formula. So what we're gonna do is we have A of T equals, actually let me write it, write it I'm gonna write it down here instead because I'll need it for the next couple of problems. So I'm gonna put it down here. So when we flip the screen, we can see what it is. So P A equals 125, because that's always gonna be the initial population no matter what, E, to the 0 0.2104, 0 0.2104, and then the time. Okay, so this right here is the, that's the exact growth formula that we're going to use uh, in this case. So this is the one that we're gonna use, okay? So we need this in order to do this next problem, how many cells are present after five hours. So these problems will have you come up with a growth formula, but then it's going to ask you a couple follow-up questions where you just use the formula and plug in information provided. So how many cells are present after five hours? Oh, and I should also, I should, I should also mention that this should be uh, an A to the T here. Okay, so A to the T is what it should be. Okay, it's got to be that function notation. So A of T equals, and just put the, the formula in. Uh, for this, we wanna put in the, find out how many cells are present after five hours. So it means everywhere I see a T, I'm gonna put in a five. So this should be 125 E to the 0 0.2104 times five. Just like that. So I wanna simplify this. I have one, 125 E, and then I'm going to multiply that together. So 0 0.2104 times five. If I put that into a calculator, I get 1.052. Don't round the exponent either when you're doing this. Leave the full decimal in there. You don't want to ever round the exponent there. 1.052. We want to use the uh, E caret key that's above the Ln button on your calculator in order to do this. So A of five is equal to, um, so if we put that in there, it's about approximately now, the, the instructions will tell you what to round to, but in this case, we'll round it to the nearest whole number. So A of five is approximately 358 cells is what, what you'll get. Okay, so uh, for this here, um, this is the final answer. Now, sometimes, I'll see students do an extra step and then they, they take this and they divide it by five because there's a five here. Remember that this is not multiplication. This is function notation here. So A of five, that's it. You're just gonna stop at that point. Your answer is 358 cells, all right? So again, no, there's no division that you're doing here because this is not, does not mean multiplication. It's a function notation. So that's it, 358. Now, we, there's one more question we're going to do based on this. Uh, how long around in the nearest hour will it take the population to reach 442 
cells. So again, A of T is equal to, uh, we have our growth formula from before. I'm just going to transfer it from the previous page. So this is what we're, it's the formula we've been using already. Okay, so 0.2104T. Uh, we want, how long does it take the population to reach 442 cells? Well, this time you're going to put 442 cells in for the A of T. And now we're going to solve for the time. So it's asking you for how long at the time that's there. It says rounded to the nearest hour. So this one, we are able to round our answer to the nearest whole number as well. You want to isolate the part that has the T in it, which means our first step is going to be to divide both sides by 125. Because that's the first step. When you do that, you're going to get a, a terminating decimal uh, 3.536. And then we get e to the 0.2104 t. So now that isolates your term that has the e in it. Uh, do not round anything until the very end. So this 3.536, you do not want to round that number. You want to leave the full number there. Don't ever round it. If you round it too early, that's why you'll end up getting the wrong answer. Okay, so just leave everything there until the very end when we round it to the nearest whole number at the end of the problem. So again, we have another problem where we have an E in it. We'll just take the natural log of both sides here. That's how we can, we do that purposely. We're taking the natural log because we want to eliminate the E and just get the, the T term by itself. So L1 and E is going to cancel out. So you're going to get natural log 3.536 is going to equal 0.2104 the the L and E go away. Then the last step you're going to do is divide both sides by 2.2104. So just divide both sides by that. When you do, we'll just round this to the nearest hour. So it's going to be six hours uh, would be the answer on that. So that's how long it would take the population to double based on this model that we have uh, here. Okay, so we're gonna uh, just do this last problem here. So does it start experiment? There's a thousand bacteria after four hours, the population doubled. We wanna kind of do the same question again. We wanna find the exponential growth formula first. So uh, in this case, the original amount, the A sub zero was given as a thousand bacteria. Now it says that it doubled. So that means that A of T a of t needs to be 2,000. The time is four hours. And again, the k, we don't know what, what that is. So now that we've identified that, we're still going to start with the same uh, growth formula. So we have this one here. We're going to plug in the 2,000 and the 1,000 in there. We're solving for k, the time is four, we put inside here. We want to divide both sides by a thousand to get the e term by itself. When you do, that's going to give you a two. So 2,000 divided by a thousand is two. Two equals e to the four k. And now we're going to take the natural log of both sides again. So we can clear out the, get rid of the, there's a four k here. So we can eliminate the E from there. So doing so, we'll give you L natural log of two is gonna equal four K and we divide both sides by four. So K equals LN two divided by four. And we wanna uh, round that to four decimal places. So we get 0 0.1733 uh, if you put that in the calculator. So our formula, which I'll write down here, A of T is gonna be equal to the, and you always wanna put the initial amount, that's always part of your, your general formula, A sub zero we put in there, E to the 0.1733 T. 
And so that right there is going to be your, your main formula we're going to use. That's for part A. That's the answer for part A. Now we're going to use this for part B. It says how many bacteria are present after six hours. We just put a six in there. 1,000 E to the 0.1733 times six. And you just put a six in there for all the uh, T's. Okay, so A of six is equal to 1,000. All right, so 0.1733 times six, we're gonna do that in the calculator first and get 1.0398, okay. And then we wanna just put that in our calculator by using the E caret button above the LN on there. So A of six is gonna equal about, if we, again, if we round it to the nearest whole number, you get 2829. Bacteria is what that's going to round to. You get 28, 28.65. And so if, it, if you want to round it to the nearest number, it's this. Um, or again, this is the this would be the exact number if you're rounding it like to two places, 28, 28.65. That would be rounded to two decimal places. It just depends on what they ask you to round to. So it depends on what it is. It'll, I'd always tell you in the instructions how many decimal places they want you to round to. Uh, then we have, and that's that's the last part. This only had two parts on it, just part A and part B. And so that's all we're gonna do for today's lesson. We will continue with this uh, tomorrow. We're not done with this section yet. Uh, so we've got a couple more growth problems to do, then we'll do a decay problem. I start with the decay type problems here. So we're uh, gonna, the rest of it we'll finish up tomorrow. Uh, and then again, like I said, Wednesday is the last day of new material for this course. This coming Thursday is a test three review. We'll go over the, the sample test. So we'll do that on, uh, on Thursday. All right. So does anybody have any questions before we end this meeting? Any questions? Okay, sounds like we don't have any questions here, so I will go ahead and end the meeting for the rest of your day. I'll see you guys tomorrow.